Okay, so this is the final topic in AP Bio, uh, 8.7, Disruptions to Ecosystems. So when we think about disruptions to ecosystems, a lot of it has to do with human activity. And our human population has been growing exponentially for the last 100 years or so. And so we are at almost 8 billion people and expected to reach our carrying capacity of 9 to 10 uh, billion people by 2050. So with this exponential growth, our impact has spread into ecosystems, communities, populations, and has brought us into the sixth mass extinction. So uh, we are going to focus on the College Board standards and things they say to talk about through the lens of HIPCO, which are the six major leading causes of extinction of species on Earth. Now, the first one being habitat loss. Now, College Board mentions that we should teach about urbanization and logging um, and like monoculture. So let's focus on those real quick here. So urbanization is when a po like a human population grows and we move into cities. Now, based on this picture alone, you can imagine the millions of people that live in this region and how much food would be required to feed them or clothing or building materials. Think about all the, the structures, all the furniture, all, all the resources that goes into uh, supporting a population of 8 billion humans. It's going to have a very large impact. Like we are going to have to spread out into natural ecosystems to get enough resources to support ourselves. Now this leads to habitat loss for species. And so um, here we see in the Indonesian rainforest, one of the major reasons for uh, habitat loss is converting the Indonesian rainforest into palm oil fields, which I have on my next slide. When we talk about our forests on earth, uh, we've cut down nearly half of the trees on earth. So um, as human civilization has grown, we've also like, it's like as we've grown, the forest communities have declined. And something about like it's either two or 5% of the original pristine forests in the United States um, are all that's left or untouched by humans. The rest have been logged. Um, some have started to like be regrowing, I guess, in what's called the secondary forest. Um, but we have very few of our native forests left in the United States. Uh, currently, globally, we um, are losing our trees and our forests of, by 64 million acres per year. And that's not losing them like, oh, they've died. It's like us going lo like logging and burning our forests. And so this is not a sustainable rate. Um, photosynthesis is one of the major ways that we can take carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere. And by deforestation, burning our forests or logging them, uh, we're doing the opposite, right? So we need a way to take carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere, and instead we're putting it up there. So uh, one thing that happens, though, due to habitat loss is this something called mon uh, monoculture. So in the Indonesian rainforest, we are removing the forest and instead planting um, palm oil plantations. And these palm oil plantations are a single crop. We call it monoculture. And as you can imagine, that is a huge reduction in biodiversity. Now, life is full of choices, and I personally choose to not buy food products that have palm oil. So I'm constantly reading ingredients, and if they include palm oil, I avoid that product. So, uh, yeah. Now, the other thing, though, it's not just logging as a reason why we're losing our forests, but we also, we mainly burn them. So the Amazon rainforest is burning at something like 24,000 football fields uh, a day. And so we can see the smoke from the Amazon rainforest uh, from outer space. And actually, 2021 was the first year that there was actually more carbon dioxide put into the atmosphere from burning the Amazon rainforest than the Amazon rainforest took out by photosynthesis. And so it became a carbon source, not a carbon sink. But we also are a threat to our aquatic biodiversity. As our oceans warm, um, it actually ends up leading to what we call coral bleaching. So our coral, as you can imagine and see, is a huge... Um, area of biodiversity, lots of different species supported in coral reefs. However, coral is a symbiotic um, organism, right? So coral is a living thing that relies on a second organism called, it's a type of protist, a zooanthophil. And together, like the coral, it's an obligate mutualistic relationship. However, the zooanthophil is a very, uh, like a specialist for its temperature that it can sustain like that it can live in 
So when we have these like warming events in our oceans, that symbiotic partner to the coral, it leaves. And that causes the coral to bleach and to die. And so by our oceans warming, we're leading to the collapse of our coral reefs. And something about, uh, something like 40 to 50% of our reefs, reefs, what the heck, are already damaged and at risk. Uh, and as climate change continues and our oceans continue to rise, we are possibly looking at global devastation to our reefs. And reefs are home to a third of marine species. And if you think about how many of those 8 billion people uh, rely on seafood as their source of protein, uh, this is a huge negative consequence for both humanity as well as ocean food webs. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the next thing that is disrupting uh, ecosystems, and that is invasive species. So we have three different ways that we can talk about species. So a native species is a species that like belongs in that ecological niche or food web or community or ecosystem. Like it's evolved having predators or maybe it itself is a predator. Um, it has maybe a symbiotic partner. Maybe it competes with other species, right? So like it has its place in the food web. Now we have these things called introduced species. Now an introduced species is not native. So an introduced species is a species that has been brought into an area. And if we like talk about introduced or non-native species, they don't always have to be disruptive or harmful to an ecosystem. But if they are, we call them an invasive species. So we want to think about as well, like when a species moves into a new area, in order for it to thrive and take off, it needs like to have appropriate in temperature and rainfall, humidity, like environmental conditions for it to actually take root and, and thrive there. And so an invasive species though, that is successful in a new area, uh, one reason why it's successful is because it outcompetes the native species. It also doesn't have any natural predators or disease in this new area. So basically it's lacking density dependent limiting factors and now it thrives and goes through exponential growth which puts the native species at risk for becoming endangered or going extinct and so invasive species cost the united states something like 50 billion dollars a year to fight and so uh, invasive species are the second leading cause of extinction i do recommend this video from ted ed um oops i'm going to skip it though uh, it is a great example of invasive species. So th I'm going to talk about three examples, though. Here we have some zebra mussels. Now, zebra mussels were unintentionally brought to the Great Lakes of the United States. And they're a little mussel, and they have to grow attached onto something, like, hard. So they actually will attach to larger mussels that are native to these lakes. And they, like, end up covering the whole bottom of the lake. This shoreline is actually all zebra mussel shells. So they incredibly uh, decimated the local ecosystem. Uh, we also have the kudzu vine, which is a vine that is said to have uh, ate the south. And so it was brought in the early 1900s to the southern part of the United States. First, it was ornamental or decorative, and then it was used to help control erosion or like soil washing away. But the issue with this vine is that it grows a foot a day and is really good at outcompeting native plant species for light and for space. So in this picture here, you can see the vine has actually grown on top of other trees. It grows on tops of houses and on cars and like basically is covering the south. And there's no natural predators or herbivores that eat it. There's no pathogens or disease. So it just takes over. And then the third one I'm gonna talk about is the Burmese python. Um, I I have a special place in my heart for the Everglades. I love Everglades National Park. And so uh, in Florida, this uh, some people, pet owners, decided they no longer wanted to keep their pythons and they let them loose. And they have grown unchecked in the Florida Everglades. They do not have any natural predators and they are generalists, which means that they eat a wide variety of food and can handle living in a wide variety of habitats, which make them the perfect kind of invasive species, but their diet is vor voracious, I don't know if you say that. So here's just a picture of like how much food one um, python would take uh, to reach about five to seven years old. 
So for invasive species, uh, the availability of resources can result in uncontrolled population growth and ecological changes. Now I'm going to talk quickly. Um, I'm not really going to talk too much about population growth because that's more in our um, population chapter or unit. But here let's talk a little bit about pollution. Now pollution is an abiotic factor. And in reality, if you really think deeply about pollution in an ecosystem, it's a density independent limiting factor on populations. So it, it can limit population growth depending on how it impacts uh, different populations and ecosystems. And so I'm going to talk just about a few examples of pollution. So one of them is called biological magnification. And this is where if we have pollution in our waterways, now, a famous example of this is DDT, a harmful pesticide sprayed in the 30s and the 40s. It was finally outlawed in the 70s or 80s, but it was um, it still persists in our waterways. It's still there today. Or we can talk about mercury in our fish. So um, when organisms at a lower trophic level take these toxins into their body tissues, it stays within the tissue of the organism. It doesn't pass through and get pooped out. So it stays. But now, as you imagine, as you go through a food web or a food chain, now let's think about all the small fish, how many zooplankton they need to eat to live their life. Like over the course of the months or years that they're alive, you're going to have lots of the toxin accumulating in the tissue of that fish. Now think about how many uh, small fish a large fish needs to eat. So as a large fish, like a tuna fish or something, um, gets eats all the small fish throughout its long life, that's all of these toxins are accumulating and concentrating within the body tissues of that larger fish. So in the case of like DDT, the birds, like our bald eagles, were eating polluted fish and it actually caused their eggs, the shells, to not harden. And so therefore their babies weren't surviving and we almost had the extinction of the American bald eagle from pollution. Now today though, in humans, we have the issue with like mercury and other toxins in our fish. And so um, there's actually like warnings, like this is a warning from Costco about like fish known to the state or to contain chemicals known to the state of California to cause reproductive harm because they're so highly polluted. So that is biological magnification. Now, another type of pollution is called eutrophication. And if we think about our farmlands across the United States, we have a lot of rivers running through them. Now, as we grow crops, they are going to build all their macromolecules. They need carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, right? Well, they get C, H, and O from carbon dioxide and water. And so with that, um, the nitrogen and the phosphorus come from the soil. So it gets depleted over the years. So we add synthetic-based nitrogen uh, fertilizers and with some phosphorus to our farmlands. Well, that nitrogen and phosphorus doesn't stay in one place. When it rains, this nitrogen and phosphorus is going to get washed into our waterways. So as it gets washed into our waterways, it eventually is going to run to the ocean, right? So if we look at um, our oceans now, as the nitrogen and phosphorus enter into our water, these excess nutrients are going to be limiting factors. Oops, it's on a timer. Limiting factors for phytoplankton. So the little phytoplankton in the ocean are going to thrive and they're going to undergo exponential growth. And their population is going to grow, grow, grow because it's like they have unlimited resources. However, eventually either those nutrients um, get used up uh, and the phytoplankton begin to die. This is where decomposers come into play, which are these little rectangles. So the decomposers are actually aerobic decomposers. So now the aerobic decomposers are going through exponential growth. And what's going to happen here is that these aerobic decomposers are going to consume all of the oxygen in the water. Now, by consuming the oxygen in the water, that's going to lead to the death of other species because there isn't enough dissolved oxygen to support life. So now we get huge areas of water that are actual dead zones. They're hypoxic which means that there's not enough oxygen and they, that can't support enough life. So if you look at the watershed of the United States, all of our farmland and all these rivers collect runoff and it goes to the Mississippi and then ends up in the Gulf of Mexico. And so this eutrophic algal blooms leads to massive die-offs 
and huge amounts of our waterways that can't support life. The fish basically suffocate. So that is eutrophication. And when we look at the size of our dead zone over the years, we see that it's over 6,000 square miles of the Gulf of Mexico that are hypoxic and can't support life. And that really comes down to an excess in nitrogen and phosphorus leading to algal blooms that end up being harmful. All right, I think I'm going to hit pause here and then finish the video in a part two. All right, great job.